Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, December the 15th. Welcome to the Board of Multnomah County Commissioners informational board briefing. In accordance with the declaration of emergency announced on March 11th and extended by the Board of County Commissioners on September 24th, today's meeting is being held virtually. I wanna thank everyone for bearing with us through any technical difficulties that may arise throughout our virtual meeting today. Please remember to mute your mic when you are not speaking. And before you present, please make sure that your mic is unmuted and your camera is on. I ask presenters to remember that the public may be listening via telephone. So please state your name before responding to questions. Our first item this morning is the recognition of our interim chief operating officer, Peggy Bray and her service to Multnomah County. And I will kick it off. So today uh, we wanted to take this time to recognize the contributions of, oh, Peggy just texted me and said she's having computer difficulties. Do you see, I just wanted to make sure that she's on so we're not having this. I don't see her at oh, all. Oh no. <laughs> Let me try you know, to her. Yeah, we try. <laughs> Sure doesn't make sense to be uh, having a celebration of her if she's not here to witness said celebration. Are the Axie folks on? Could we jump to that one, John? Good morning, Chair Kafori. Um, yes, uh, our presenters are here and we're ready to go whenever you are. Okay. Peggy just got on, just so you know. Oh, she did. Okay. <laughs> Remember how just a few moments ago I was asking everyone to bear with us for any technical difficulties that may arise? And lo and behold, the very first agenda item has technical difficulties. You couldn't have planned it any better. All right, Peggy Bray, are you on? I am. Peggy? Okay. Good. We didn't want to fet you without your smiling face in attendance. All right. Now to get back to the celebration. All right. Today we want to take a moment to recognize the contributions of Peggy Bray, the county's interim chief operating officer who is retiring at the end of this month. And I know that's kind of a scary thing for her. So we will retirement is a heavy word, but um when Peggy took the reins as interim COO earlier this year, she had no idea what she was in for. <laughs> we were just beginning to understand the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Since then, Peggy has used her social work and her public policy experience to see past the surface of complex situations to really discover the underlying issues that need to be addressed. Given that Multnomah County has been at the forefront of our community's response to the pandemic, calls for racial justice and even wildfire smoke her skills have proved invaluable even though she had no idea she'd be putting them to work on such a on such big challenges when she agreed to take this position it really goes without saying that i have so appreciated you peggy and your counsel during these rocky months even before the pandemic uh, peggy helped the county through some of our most difficult times as the Department of County Human Services Director, Peggy and her deputy at, director at the time, Mohammed Bader, designed and led the investigation into our mental health division to assure that it appropriately accepts, investigates, and forwards abuse complaints as required by law. She led a comprehensive audit of complaints to ensure all documented complaints of abuse and neglect had been responded to, and she crafted detailed staff and process recommendations for quality improvement. You spend any time with Peggy, you hear a lot about quality improvement. We asked her to help improve other systems too, knowing that she would find not only the root cause of an issue, but also how we could avoid those problems in the future. Throughout her time at the county, Peggy has also mentored emerging county leaders, quietly coaching them on matters like communications and quality assurance. 
She's also been an early and steadfast ally to our employee resource groups and employees of color. Even with retirement on the horizon, Peggy agreed to step up to take on this interim role to assure stability at an incredibly critical time for Multnomah County. And there's no doubt that her final role here has helped set the, set the stage for the success of our next COO, as well as success of our county. But that's who Peggy's always been for the nine years that she's worked here. Someone willing to lead, to step forward, and to set others up for success. Peggy always has a smile on her face, often with her <laughs> trademark bright red lipstick and her <laughs> Sally Jesse Raphael glasses, even when things feel heavy. She is genuinely warm and compassionate, and the encouragement she spreads so generously never ever feels fake. Her leadership, her smile, and her fabulous hosting abilities will be missed at the county. <laughs> And while she's re although she is retiring, we know that she won't be very far away and I'm sure we'll see more of her in the future. And with all this practice that we have on Zoom, there is no excuse. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you. And next we have Travis, Travis Graves. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, I'm Travis Graves, uh, chair and board your Chief Human Resource Officer and Interim DCM Director. Um, I just appreciate that I get a chance to, to say a few words about Peggy. I've had the pleasure of working with her um, since she's been working in DCHS, whether it was a Division Director or a Deputy Director or a Department Director, or now her new role as the Interim COO as Marisa moved on to um, Metro. I, I I love, Chair, how, how you said I've, you know, we were stepping into it, both of us actually, interim roles at the same time. And had you, had we had a crystal ball and been able to kind of look forward, I think Peggy and I probably would have ran screaming, say, what <laughs> are we getting ourselves into? Uh, um, I would have to say, though, luckily with Peggy, she's a problem solver, right? So she, she is going to just step right in. And as much as the pandemic threw at us, Peggy dug in, pulled all of us together and says, you know, how are we going to be able to get through this? Like, what systems and structure do we need to change? She's such, you know, like you said, quality improvement is what Peggy's known for. And so she always looks for those root causes. She's figuring out how can we deconstruct a process? Where do we make sure we get the feedback from the right people? How are we going to turn this process or policy upside down? How are we going to respond in the middle of an emergency in the way that the organization or the community needs us to? Um, luckily, we had Peggy there to help lead us to be able to figure it out. Over the last nine months, um, Peggy has worked tirelessly. Day, night, weekdays, weekends, holidays, whenever, honestly. Um, Peggy is always there. You know that if something's happening or if it's an emergency, she's gonna be right there with you figuring out how to get from A to Z. So um, I've just, Peggy and I have joked for years, honestly, that she says, I think I'm ready to retire. I'm gonna retire soon. No, I think I'm really going to retire. Now she's actually doing it. So I just have to say, like, one final, you, you deserve it. Uh, I'm glad. I mean, I wish I was right there behind you, but I've got a long time to go. Um, I hope you really have the best time. And like the chair said, we're not going to, don't forget, we're not very far away. Keep in touch. Um, and I hope you just have the best and most well-deserved break um, and enjoy yourself in retirement, Peggy. Oh, thank you. Kimberly Melton. Good morning, uh, Kim Melton. I use she, her pronouns. I'm chief of staff for Chair Kafori, and I get to say a couple of things um, about Peggy today, and I promise to <laughs> not make anybody cry. Uh, uh, <laughs> Peggy, when I first uh, landed this role of chief of staff, you were one of the first people to reach out to me to offer your support, to offer your uh, friendship and your sage wisdom. And not just so that we would work well together, but so we would understand each other and find common ground and learn from one another and build relationships. And relationship is really something that's important to you, whether that's your social work background, but I think it's just also who you are at your core. And in doing that relationship building, 
paves the way to be able to do really great work together. And our relationship has made me smarter, more thoughtful. It's helped me learn to value linear thinking, <laughs> valuable, and also that continuous quality improvement and, um, and to integrate that just into the way we think about our work. And when you became interim COO, you jumped in with both feet, ready to serve, ready to learn, and always with an eye towards how we can best serve our community members and keeping them at the core. Um, you've been a real ally in this work, ready to do your own work and embrace the tough conversations to create spaces for the voices that haven't been heard. Um, you step into learning and that's rare in your passion. You have a passion for justice and that's the kind of leadership that I believe we need and the kind of leadership that we should treasure. Uh, and so 10 months ago or so when you stepped into the COVID space, we had no idea what lie ahead, but you weren't scared away. You took it on courageously with humor, with your red glasses and a calmness that can only come from experience. And uh, your social work ethic definitely has paid off as we were all um, going through it in the days and the nights that we spent at the Multnomah building and then at the McCoy building. Um, you always that re you remember that in addition to all of our hand sanitizer everywhere on the table and all the wipes, we also <laughs> needed snacks and treats and we also needed a break. And you were the first person to tell myself and the chair that we needed to go home and go to sleep mm -hmm. and take a beat and come back the next day. So I appreciate your honesty and holding us accountable uh, both for our own health and wellness so that we can serve the community better. I cheer you on as you move into your next chapter of fun travels, when that's a thing again, um, fun projects and sharing more of that light and wisdom with the world. Um, C.S. Lewis says that there are far better things ahead than any we leave behind. And that's what I truly hope for you. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> And I have no doubt that our commissioners have words that they would like to pass on to you as well. So we are gonna start um, with Commissioner Myron. Uh, um, oh, Peggy. Um, so I have just admired these pictures. I've just admired Peggy. Um, you i'm kind of looking at you peggy on my screen as you appear here um but um since the first time i met you which is when i was running for this office and i i just still remember connecting with you and how immediately i just felt this um bond like here is a person who thinks like i do you know who sees the world in that systems way um who is just so thoughtful and um, brilliant, and that it just uh, it um, that came out that sparkle, that spark. Um, even that first time I talked to you, and that's just borne out over the four years I've had the pleasure of working with you. Um, and I just feel so fortunate to um, that our paths have overlapped at the this same time that I've been here. Um, you are such a compassionate, thoughtful, caring person. Um, and, you know, it's that, yeah, your social, that social work heart that um, just overflows from you and you can sense that, but you always tie into the bigger systems. And I just love that about you. Um, and you just also, you just cut to the chase. So, um, I know every time we talk about something, when I would mention, you know, like, oh, here's a thing I've been thinking about. Um, first of all, you you listen and you actually hear what's being said, which is just such a beautiful thing. Um, and I know you understand. And then I know you'll get whatever it is addressed like immediately. And most of the time you're two steps or more ahead of me and what I'm thinking. So it's just been so lovely to to have that connection be able to um be able to work with you i um appreciate so much when those uh issues arose with regard to the mental health division um when i heard 
Peggy Bray was going to be on it. It's like, oh, okay, problem solved. You know, that I, I knew it was in such good hands. And I just love that approach to systems, to quality assurance, to always making sure there's coordination um, and communication and that we are doing the best that we we're the best we can be. Um, yeah, interesting time to come into the role uh, for sure. And um, I think it was almost a bit of a challenge like, OK, Peggy, so you're good. <laughs> Here's what we're going to throw at you. And um, you just rose to the challenge and beyond. And again, we are so fortunate to have you um, here, especially during this time. So you are a shining light. You just have a sparkle and such wonderful energy. And I will miss I will miss having you here, but know that you you are close and you're you're not going away. You're just going to have a chance to maybe relax. Um, so thank you for all that you've done for our county and and just for me personally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Commissioner Jaipal. Thank you, Chair. Um, Peggy, uh, I, you know, I have a similar memory as the one that Commissioner Myron shared, which is that I met you also while I was campaigning. And then we had coffee together in that long period between the election and my taking office. Um, I have so appreciated all of the qualities that people have talked about. Your relentless focus on improvement, your understanding that um, finding places to improve isn't criticism. It isn't something to be defensive about that it really is, it's it's honesty and directness and figuring out how to serve people in the best way that we can. And your, your focus on assessing learning and then making changes based on what you've learned, I've really, really appreciated. I too have appreciated the systems approach, the fact that you look at things holistically. Um, your kindness, I think that that, I'm looking at this wonderful portrait of you <laughs> and I just feel like that kindness shines through and that that's what that's the value that guides everything that you do in terms of your relationships with the people that you work with, your relationships with the people that you and we serve. Kindness is undervalued often these days in leadership, and I think it's a tremendously important quality of leadership, and I have greatly appreciated that. Your optimism, your cheer, your good cheer um, helps make a heavy time lighter and, and it should be lighter. It doesn't have to be heavy. Um, and I cannot let you go without, again, admiring and being envious of your taste in footwear and jewelry. I have truly appreciated it. <laughs> so I just um, I value you so much, Peggy, and I, I know you're going to be around. Um, and I look forward to finding other times and places to be able to work with you again. Thank you for everything that you've done for our community. Thank you so much. Commissioner Peggy Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, so Peggy, as somebody who has a very strong appreciation for uh, red lipstick, I, <laughs> and statement glasses, I um I actually have always felt such a like wonderful connection with you and had just have enjoyed working with you um in all your different roles so so much. Um I have appreciated the, your um your leadership, your intelligence, your um approach of, of really, you know, as Travis was saying like tackling any problem that comes your way and really not seeing it as a problem but as an opportunity and and like that we have the tools, we have the um, effort, we have what we need in order to, um, you know, attack the issues and, and work on it. And you see, you take on these things as a challenge. I remember um, one of the first meetings that we had when we were talking about the Preschool for All Task Force and what this would mean. And I think there was a, some of us sitting around a table in my office back when we did that. And, um, you know, we were just we were just really talking about this potential, and this promise, and it was such a hopeful, optimistic meeting. And that's really what I've taken from you um, for that. And so many things that you've um, approached. Um, I appreciate you um, sharing books with me as we've talked about process improvement and how much I love that and, you know, organizational and project planning and um, some kinships there. But I have to say my most Peggy Bray memory 
is like literally the day you gave me the ring off your finger <laughs> because it matched the bracelet I was wearing. <laughs> like you literally like, here, you have it, take it. It was like literally the most Peggy Bray moment ever. Um, <laughs> and I love it. I eventually gave you the ring back, but I did wear it because it did match it beautifully. And, um, and if that, that doesn't exemplify your generous spirit, your heart, your doing what it takes to make sure things work, like the, the bracelet and the ring just had to go together, like all of it was, was right there. So um, thank you for your spirit. I wish you all of um, the best luck in retirement. Lots of fun. Lots of fun trips in your great car and um, and just really um, looking forward to continue working with you and know we'll stay in touch. Um, but I'm so glad and so and feel so um, so honored that I've gotten to know you and work with you and learn from you over this year years and just so much um, appreciation for the way that you've served Multnomah County and all of our Multnomah County residents. So thank you, Peggy. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Do you remember the ring. <laughs> Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, hey, I didn't get any jewelry, so we'll talk later. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, everybody's mentioned uh, your love of quality improvement. And uh, at one point in my life, I worked in uh, the manufacturing field. And, and so you and I kind of had that, that shared interest in uh, looking at how we could improve processes. And uh, you know, I really have to thank you for all of your support around our policy work with uh, violence uh, and the intersectionality of it. And we know that we have some internal work uh, to uh, improve um, or to tear down some of the silos that exist uh, between different departments. Uh, and you have just been so helpful in really bringing together. I, I remember being in meetings with you where different department um, Leads would say, you know, we have the same problem, and we would find commonality to work, uh, to to work better together. And so, I just really appreciate all of your support around that policy area, and uh, you know, just your smile and your presence. I mean, everyone has said is that, you know, it, it could be like the worst day, but here comes my check in with Peggy, and she's just got this smile uh, and just this um, sense of positivity always around you, and so you just uplift people and. A smile really goes a long way, and you always, always bring that, and, and it's so meaningful, especially in, in times like this. And, you know, the other thing I'd like to say is that, uh, you know, I've often heard Multnomah County referred to as Mother Multnomah, and I think that you really embody that, is that you've been such a caretaker, such a genuine spirit, and, and when I first came onto the board, you just like welcomed me with open arms and you were so kind and so gracious. And uh, it was just more about how how people feel when when you're around them and, and how you make them feel. You make them feel loved and important and cherished. And uh, for that, I know you did that for so many people at Multnomah County and we'll always be grateful. And I hope that you enjoy your retirement and do all the fun things uh, that really make you happy, and uh, I hope to see you around. So thank you for everything, and you just continue. I, all the challenges that you've just been thrown is like it's kind of like Mikey. Let's get Peggy to do it. <laughs> is it? Is it? We know that you could handle anything, and um, sadly, you know, our bench has been so deep uh, with with people like you. Uh, but I know that you've brought up other people behind you. Uh, but I'm really sad to see you go. But I wish you all the best and we'll miss you dearly. When Kim was talking about the uh, how, how you helped our mental health along with everything else uh, during the especially early stage of the pandemic, she forgot to mention that you kept us um, dressed well with the stylish masks that your uh, daughter-in-law made, uh, which I love very much. So it extends all, all across the way. Thank you so much, Peggy. And I, of course we would, we want you to say, have this time to say a few words as well. You're on, you're on mute. 
Uh, how about now? Oh, oh, the one time I'm talking, you couldn't hear me. <laughs> Thank you all so, so much. I'm I'm overwhelmed and appreciative of you all. And yeah, it's it's a it's been a an amazing journey coming here nine years ago from Michigan, not knowing the county, not knowing Portland, and uh, I felt welcomed. I felt welcomed by the community. And what impressed me with the commission then and impresses me now is just that commitment and value driven uh, shared perspective for our community and for our staff and for what's right and for equity and justice. You all have that. And, and certainly over the last nine years, I've, I've seen some interesting bumps along the way. That's been fun, um, but really, always that consistent uh, mission and value that you've shared and just tremendous leadership with all you. And of course, Chair, it's just been amazing working with you and getting to know you even better. And I wore the scarf. You might remember one day you needed an accessory. So I wore that for you. And um, just the, the team, you know, the team that I've gotten to know over the last nine, nine plus years, uh, you, you have amazing leaders, again, still with that very clear vision of, of uh, who we are as a, as a safety net and as a, as a community member. And in the last 10 months with the pandemic, and you're right, Kim Melton, you know, she took me to dinner and asked me about this position. She did not she did not tell me about this piece. I just have to say, Kim, you owe me another margarita. But um, it was, you know, even that, I mean, yeah, I, I do lean in to, to opportunities, but it was, it was, um, I don't want to say it was easy, but there's so much talent and so much brilliance and so much, again, just that, that, that heart uh, in all our response to this emergency, it's just been overwhelming and amazing. And if you think about where we've come and where we are now, um, just so much growth and so much really uh, family orientation to this work. I think we are a family. Um, and so I'm, you know, I appreciate being uh, part of that family and I can be the crazy aunt that you invite, you know, in now and again. So, you know, glad to do that, but I just thank you so much. It's just been an absolute honor, privilege. And uh, yeah, I'm around, so you're not rid of me. I'll just, you know, something you, know, you just, Give me a buzz and I'll be there. So, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Peggy. And I'm, I am very sorry that we can't celebrate in person. So please know that, that we're there in your, in your house with you right now, giving you virtual hugs. <laughs> For sure. And there'll be the annual holiday gathering. So be alert, we will do that. All right, well, next we are going to move on to our annual briefing from the board of the Advisory Committee on Sustainability and Innovation, affectionately known as AXI. Good morning, Chair um, and Commissioners. My name is John Voschatinsky. I'm the Sustainability Director from Multnomah County. Um, and just a quick sound check, can you all hear me? Excellent, all right, last time I was having some technical difficulties. Um, so I'm, I'm before the board on a regular uh, basis, but um, this is one of my favorite things um, I do um, with with the with the board um, annually because we get to bring folks uh, before you who spend a lot of time volunteering their talents to the county. Um, and today we have uh, Ryan Vanderbrink and Mara Gross, our our two um, chairs for the advisory committee, um, and I'll let them introduce themselves in a second. Um, but I wanted just to start off, if we can go to the next slide, please, by noting um, what a profound impact um, the advisory committee has had um, on our office, the Office of Sustainability and, and, and really policy at the county. Um, they've been around since 2010 as, a, as, a, as an advisory board. And we've had through um, that team, uh, so many talented folks. Uh, who have offered uh, freely of their of their um, knowledge to to the county, and we've benefited a ton from that. I also want to thank um, Commissioner Vega Peterson and her staff uh, for all the time that they've dedicated to um, being our kind of legislative liaisons to this committee. 
Um, it's been a huge help uh, to me uh, personally, and uh, I think to the folks on the team to feel connected to the board to have that direct conduit to Commissioner Vega Peterson. Um, so, so just wanted to extend a, a thank you to that as well. Next slide, please. Um, and I just wanted to offer a couple areas where, um, you know, things that we maybe take for granted in our office now, but were at one time just nascent ideas. Um, really, our work on air toxics over the years, whether it's been our advocacy for a statewide um, air toxics program, the Clean Air Oregon um, has really was really germinated. Uh, our work on diesel, our work on wood smoke, all those ideas were really germinated and fostered. Um, on the advisory committee, on our air toxic subcommittee. So I just wanted to thank, um, you know, over the years that that leadership and, and draw that out as an example of, of work that may not have happened without this committee. Property fit, our um, commercial uh, property assessed clean energy program. Similarly, um, really the, the initial vetting of that policy idea took place and, and um, AXI members brought together experts that they knew from across um, the industry, the energy efficiency industry and the finance industry to help us um, at the county think through um, the implementation of this program. And then our climate action plan um, committee members have been there, um, you know, really from the beginning, helping us um, look at the various actions that the county can take in order to um, reduce our emissions and prepare for the impacts of the climate crisis. So. Those are just a few examples, and there's more I could I could talk about. Um, but really, we're not here to talk about the past. We're here to talk about the future. Um, the the committee has um, submitted uh, their latest letter to the board, um, and with that, I'll pass it over to our outgoing chair in his waning days um, on the committee, um, uh, Ryan Vanderbrink. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Uh, my name is Ryan Vandenbrink. As John said, I use he, his pronouns. Uh, I am both an attorney in and a resident of Multnomah County. It is my sixth year serving on AXI, and I'd like to thank the board and the Office of Sustainability for the opportunity to serve on AXI, as well as for the um, support for AXI's work and the proposals, including this annual letter of recommendation. Uh, could we move to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, as you can see, transportation is the largest source of emissions in Multnomah County by sector. Uh, and if the county is going to meet its goal of 100% renewable energy for all types of energy by 2050, uh, it must address the transportation component. We in AXI feel like this is um, an important area, so much so that there has been in the last two years a subcommittee formed to sort of evaluate where the county might serve on different roles as county leadership currently does, um, but also to push this issue further because we feel like it's not just a climate issue, it's also a health and well being issue. Uh, where the county also has a lot of work programs and commitments. Fewer vehicle miles traveled locally, cleaner fuel sources for transportation, increased use of transit, uh, and active transportation options will all help further these goals. Um, but this year we wanted to raise um, the issue of transit initiatives and funding particularly fair, stable service enhancements, um, which faces great uncertainty in these times. And this is why AXI recommends that the county and the Office of Sustainability engage jurisdictions, transportation committees that currently exist, and community coalitions that are finding their feet or already formed uh, to convene and begin a real discussion on climate-friendly, innovative, equitable, and permanent transportation funding options. AXI believes that uh, although we may not know what this looks like, the county can serve as an important advocate to improve all modes of transportation in the region, uh, as well as to consider new approaches to transit funding that will help further the county's climate, health, and equity goals. Uh, next slide. Um, 
I think I'm up now. Um, so hi, can everyone hear me? Hi, I am, my name is Mara Gross. My pronouns are she, her. I am the vice chair of AXI, um, which I became thanks to CONFAM moving on to bigger things um, at the legislature. I'm also the incoming chair of AXI starting next year as Ryan graduates from his six years on the, on, um, on the committee. So I've worked on equity and sustainability issues for many years. I'm now um, the interim executive director at the Coalition of Community Health Clinics. So I've also been working with the Integrated Clinical Services, Joint Office of Homeless Services. And I just wanna thank you for your time today, especially given the immediacy of COVID-19, health and economic impacts. Um, you know, we've got urgent and overlapping crises of climate and COVID and racism. And I really appreciate um, your commitments to addressing them together. Um, so I'll just right now talk a little bit about the um, climate action plan, the county, uh, city county climate action plan. As you know, the county's goal is to achieve 100% clean energy by 2050, known in shorthand as uh, 100 by 50. Uh, and the first principle of that is to center climate justice in frontline communities. Um, so this 2015 climate action plan is, has been the roadmap for the county's work to address climate change and it's structured around five-year actions. Um, as you heard earlier this year, um, the report from the, the county and city of Portland received an in, re, released an interim report um, showing that most of the actions that were um, in the 2015 plan are underway and over three quarters are set to be completed this year. Um, so that's great news. Um, and it means it's time for the county to update its climate commitments with an updated timeline for implementation. Um, and it's also um, an opportunity for bolder and more concrete actions. With the climate crisis accelerating, the public demanding stronger action and a much needed greater focus on racial justice, it's a real opportunity for deeper and more transformative change as we develop the new plan. Next slide. Handing it back to Ryan. Thank you. Uh, this is Ryan Vandenbrink again. Uh, earlier I touched on the county's overall 100 by 50 renewable energy commitment for all fuel types. And with this slide and this recommendation, uh, I'd like to touch on some sub goals within that commitment. Uh, as separate goals, the county has committed to source its own and the entire community's electricity needs from renewable sources with a transition date of 2035 for the community. Uh, AXI and the county um, commends the leadership and the board for already meeting its own energy needs with renewable sources, uh, even without the need to purchase RECs to get there. Uh, that is a great accomplishment in a short amount of time. Uh, looking at the other prong of the electricity goal though, 2035 is coming up pretty soon. Uh, and the county should help out the community and help formulate a plan and a toolkit of options for the community to switch to renewable electricity uh, by the deadline. Not all of the answers may be available yet, and because this is intended to be a community-driven transition, uh, the approach may change, but AXI recommends that uh, the county and that the Office of Sustainability can create a baseline study and a preliminary iterative strategic plan in 2021 that will help assemble all of the necessary information to guide jurisdictions, energy suppliers, other stakeholders, and community members in this effort. Taking information from the 100 by 50 resolution, uh, the findings and the commitments, this study should strive to assemble information on uh, where we are, where the county sources its electricity, by utility, by other suppliers, and including community generated electricity. Uh, how the county consumes its electricity by use, including backward and forward looking uh, trend lines to see where the best efforts might be applied by the community. Estimates of pollution levels currently tied to that electricity. Current public commitments and plans of utilities and other energy suppliers. Uh, and their transition to renewable, as well as a timeline for that transition. And uh, any major consumer, electricity consumer commitments to increase efficiency. 
uh, as well as the absence of major consumers uh, that might be leaned on to increase their efficiency so that we have both a supply side and a demand side evaluation to know where we are, where we've been, and where the county needs to go in order to uh, meet this commitment by 2035. If possible, um, according to the resolution, the study should break out analysis on current community infrastructure and programs, low-income households, tribes, and communities of color to assess how they're served and whether the benefits and the burdens are equally shared. Uh, it should also, the study should also identify major barriers to switching to renewable electricity, such as necessary legislative or PUC uh, changes for specific community toolkit options uh, and other administrative or policy barriers that may exist. Identifying these early on in the study will help the community, uh, the state, and the county address these barriers and moving forward so that everything can move forward on an iterative, um, improving timeline basis. Uh, and this resulting study would be helpful to all stakeholders to meet the county's targets and eliminate any of those barriers uh, on the appropriate timeline. Uh, next slide and back to Mara. Great. So again, I am Mara Gross um, and I am excited that I get to um, talk just a little bit about the Climate Justice Initiative. Um, so for context in 2018, the County Commission, you approved a resolution affirming the county support um, for environmental justice. It acknowledged the long history of race-based exclusionary practices, the ongoing disparities and the leadership of people of color in advancing environmental justice. Um, and to be blunt, our old models of addressing climate um, haven't worked for a lot of folks in our communities, for people of color and other affected communities. And it's time for new, new ways of working. And so the Climate Justice Initiative represents this new approach. The concept is that it will be co-created and co-convened by Multnomah, Multnomah County and frontline communities and designed for communities to set a shared agenda with government. Um, it's an exciting approach and the board can honor it by you know, advancing the outcomes of the process, committing to, to moving it forward. Um, I can't remember, y'all, is that, was that the end of our presentation or was there, were there one other thing? Ah, opening it up for questions. There we go, if anyone has any. Thank you. Um, I will open it up to the commissioners for questions and comments and just wanted to say thanks for coming this morning. I know that this is, not quite the way that we have done in the past, and I appreciate you bearing with us as we <laughs> our new way of doing business. Uh, we will start this time with Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, John and Ryan. Thank you so much for your commitment for these past six years. Uh, it sounds like uh, you're leaving us in good hands with Mara, and Mara, thank you for stepping up. So thank you for this presentation. I really appreciate the fact that you highlighted that we're at 77% uh, of our, our goals, but while that's good, it also indicates uh, that we need to revisit those goals and probably set some higher standards for ourselves. And Mara, I think you, uh, both you and Ryan highlighted the, the fact that we need to include uh, more racial justice perspectives and what barriers uh, BIPOC community members are facing, and that's incredibly important. Uh, and, you know, I mean, just the fact that we uh, need to continue to hold utilities and all of our partners and all of the people that we do business with uh, to a higher standard is incredibly important. So thank you for keeping this on our radar. And uh, it's hard right now, I mean, because we are obviously dealing with a pandemic and environmental issues are not gonna go away just because we have a pandemic. And so keeping this at the forefront and continuing uh, to, to fight uh, for change is incredibly important. So I thank you for coming today and thank you for your leadership. Commissioner Peggy Peterson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for um, this report and this presentation. I have really loved working with AXI. 
um, over the past four years and having my office be the liaison um, on, on your work to the board. Um, Hayden in my office has been um, really enjoyed the work, has, has, has loved the partnership, the um, um, way, you know, coming up policy. And I and I have as well. And so I just um, Ryan, I, I can't see your face right now, but I just wanted to thank you so much. Uh, for your for serving on Axie for the past six years, it's been wonderful getting to meet with you regularly about the the work of Axie, um, and and the recommendations. And Mara, it's it's I'm wonder I'm so happy that you're stepping into this role and look forward to continuing this good work, especially because we do have so much important work um, in front of us. You know, I think um, these reports are really meaningful and valuable for us as a board because they give us um, you know really good perspective and advising on which. Uh, pieces of legislation we want to, you know, be paying attention to which um, local action we want to be taking, um, you know, paying attention to and really um, focusing in on. And I think these, um, I feel like these recommendations that you've given this time are a little bit different in that they're, they're, they're bigger, they're broader, they're a little more um, um, ambitious in scope. And I love that, um, you know, and I think the transportation piece is so, um, so key as we've made gains in Cleaning up our energy sector on other um, in other ways are the um, climate impacts of our transportation sector have just grown over the last 10 years. And so we really need to address that one. And um, as you know, I sit on a lot of different transportation tables. And so I'm looking to continue this partnership as we're, you know, as um, we're making investments with dollars on different projects and ways that we're growing our transportation system. And um, and I think that it's great that Axie as a as a climate and sustainability advisory committee is really looking at the funding issue of transportation and how that is going to make a big difference because some of the times the things that are cheapest in transportation are those that are also the most damaging for our climate. So I so this is going to, I see a lot of opportunities ahead for this work as well as the work between the county and the city on the um, climate justice initiative and, and all of the good work that we have as we look at really being aggressive in our um, in our renewable goals and our in our climate goals here. So thank you so much um, for this report. Thank you so much for your work. Ryan, thanks again for your leadership and um, and looking forward to some good work in the future. Thank you. Commissioner Jaipal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, John and Ryan and Mara. I really appreciate this work, really appreciate you being here. I want to start by uh, more appreciation, appreciating some of the historic work that you've done that John called out, the toxic work, because that's work that we continue to build on. Um, my office has been really interested in expanding, strengthening our wood smoke regulation, for example. Um, I'm chairing a task force at the legislature around developing funding sources for the, the diesel transition and, and just recognizing that that work sits sort of stands on your shoulders. So thank you so much for that. Um, I love this this report and the recommendations. I really appreciated it. Um, the the focus on transit and transportation that's so important, and then widening with that the the larger lens of the connection, making the connections between justice and climate. Um, and as you said, Mara, these overlapping crises that we're facing. Um, and also really appreciate the fact that you're calling on us to to be leaders, to look beyond what we can do within our immediate sphere of influence. And, uh, and, and really not rest on our laurels there, but tackle what the next challenges are gonna be, even though the, those are really significant challenges. So thank you so much for your work, Ryan. Thank you for your six years of service. Um, Mara, really looking forward to, to seeing your leadership in the next couple of years. And um, thank, thank you again, very grateful for this. Sorry, my cat is driving me crazy at this very oh. moment. <laughs> no, <it's> just, oh. <laughs> he's in places he shouldn't be. Sorry about that focus. Yeah, as um, do. <laughs> Commissioner Myron, you're up. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, thank you to John, um, as always, for your your work and your, your leadership um, over the years. And um, Ryan and Mara, really um, loved this presentation. Uh, it it's it was so um, so um, really meaningful. It it, uh, it went deep. And um, Ryan, thank you specifically for your work um, uh, and your service over the past six years and your leadership as chair. 
uh, and Mara, um, welcome and appreciate your service and your um, and the work that you will be doing as chair moving forward. Um, I am I'm really excited to see where things go because, as my fellow commissioners have said, um, I, we have made some really good progress and we've set some really uh, you know, um, impressive goals at Multnomah County to really be innovative and be leaders in this area. Um, but we need to move forward. And I think as Mara said, we need to take that bold action to, to continue to be leaders and push the envelope, um, particularly when it comes to issues of, um, of uh, engagement with community in the work that we're doing, and in particular with regard to racial equity um, and justice. Uh, I um, appreciated how you described all of those intersections of, um, you know, the, the climate crisis uh, also is just intimately interwoven with the, the crises we're seeing with regard to um, racial justice and also health, and um, they're inextricably linked. And you can't really tease those out. It it, it is all and. So um, really appreciate the presentation. And I uh, kind of love the recommendation that you had about. I'm looking. I put it in my notes on the where I um, where I jotted it down. I just randomly make notes to myself. But um, talking about the recommendation for uh, really doing that baseline study and then sort of that iterative strategic planning um, process. And uh, so that we, um, and I think this was as Ryan said, we know um, not just where we've been and where we are, but setting those steps of where we need to go. And I think, um, I mean, we're well on the way to doing this and uh, need to keep pushing that envelope. So um, thank you for this excellent presentation and for your service. I will just add my thank you um, to John and his team, uh, to Ryan uh, for your service. Can, thank you for all you've done over the past few years and um, look forward to your leadership, Mara. Um, AXI has a long history with Multnomah County of, of being, I will argue, the one of, if not the uh, most active and impressive um, committees, both because of the the depth of the work that you all do into into really in, into the issues, but also the way that you um, you push us forward. Uh, it, it's not just a group that it that's kind of out there that gets together and, and comes up with with an occasional idea. You really, you really bring the current issues, the strongest issues, to the forefront, and as and as I said, you push us, make us go further, do better, be stronger. And it's a um, a high bar. It's a big pair of shoes for you to fill, Mara. But I I know that you'll continue to be um, such a wonderful, a wonderful organization so group, and we really value. Uh, your your advice we value the direction that you uh you tell us to head and um i would say that we usually take um we usually take the steps that you outline for us so it's an it's an amazing partnership and look forward to continuing to um to lead on this issue and um with with john at the helm and, and commissioner vega peterson there in in the lead on this i i know we've got a lot of important work to do ahead. So thank you very much, all. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Have a happy holiday. And our next and last briefing this morning is an informational board briefing on what else? COVID-19. Jessica Guernsey, Multnomah County's Public Health Director, you are up. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay. 
This is um, Jessica Grinsey, um, Public Health Director. I use she, her pronouns. Um, good morning. I'll be joined by um, Dr. Jennifer Vines, our health officer this morning, um, to provide a few updates. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So today um, we're going to run through some of our uh, standard slides to let you all know um, what we're seeing in the community with regards to um, COVID-19 spread. Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, some updates to our testing data and um, testing. And then we're going to spend the bulk of the time doing a little bit of level set of where we are with the unbelievable news of rolling out a COVID-19 vaccine and I, I just want to take a minute to appreciate the moment um, in terms of timelines and, and work and all that it's taken to get to this point. It's a pretty unbelievable moment in this whole, whole event and it, it certainly isn't the end, but it is um, a moment of hope that has taken a lot of hard work to get to. So we're going to talk um, a little bit more in detail about where we're at with um, what we know about the current vaccines. Um, little bit of an update on the planning that we're doing um, at the state level um, in collaboration with the state and locally. Um, I know there's lots of questions about um, prioritization and how this whole operation is going to happen. So we're going to do our best to answer questions that um, that you all have today, um, knowing that there's a lot more information and planning to come. So um, we will be back again um, frequently with this information. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rines. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Can I just get a quick sound check? Look at yes, nods. Okay, great. Um, so I'll ask for the next slide. And as I do so, I'll just echo what Jessica said. It is incredible to be here with you in mid-December 2020. It was a year ago at this time approximately that the very first reports were emerging out of Wuhan, China of a new coronavirus. It is incredible to be here a year later um, talking to you about a vaccine. Um, but first, we wanna make sure you know what's happening with the pandemic locally um, and be really clear that while there's incredibly good news uh, that we're sharing today, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and a lot of people still suffering the consequences of this virus. So um, here is the curve that we look at in public health that should look very familiar to you. Um, this is the curve that we've been trying to flatten and you can see how well we flattened it as you look to the left um, and see, see what in hindsight looks like uh, very few cases back, spring, back in the spring, um, a bump in the summer, and then a really rapid steep increase um, as the colder weather set in. Uh, if you follow the blue line, that's our BIPOC, so our Black Indigenous people of color, um, and below that, uh, the uh, white, a uh, number of white uh, people uh, uh, with, the, with the virus. And so you see that um, the disproportion, uh, disproportionate impacts continue to affect our, uh, our BIPOC community members. Next slide, please. Um, again, very familiar to you, this is the testing percent positivity. This is the numerator denominator measure that tells us uh, a little bit more about what's happening with uh, disease um, and accounts for things like an increase in testing. Uh, in general, the benchmarks are if you're at less than 5%, you're doing pretty well. If you're between 5 and 10%, you probably need to take action. And if you're over 10%, um, you're really potentially in trouble. So you can see why <laughs> as we headed up that steep curve. Um, into the eight and nine percent range, you can see why uh, we supported the governor in the various uh, pauses and freezes, really just urging people to pull back, um, especially over Thanksgiving. Uh, and it looks like we have not seen a big Thanksgiving rise in hospitalizations, which is amazing news. And I really hope um, for anyone from the public uh, who's listening, I hope we can keep that up through the December holidays in, in the hopes that next year at this time, our holidays will feel a bit more like normal. Next slide, please. Um, these are COVID-19 hospitalizations. So even though we're excited to talk about vaccine today, uh, literally hundreds of people are being hospitalized for this virus across the state. And there's still an emerging medical understanding of so-called long COVID, which are people who get an infection uh, and go on to have symptoms uh, in the longer term. And that's regardless of the severity of their original infection. So. 
um, still much to learn about this virus and uh, a, a real deep concern on the part of public health to prevent as many cases as we can uh, between vaccination and our go-to um, face coverings uh, and social distancing. So this, uh, uh, again, should be familiar to these are hospitalizations um, also by race. Uh, and so you see uh, reflected, of course, the curves. Um, and if your eyes are good enough, you can see uh, some of some of the breakdown by race, uh, with the middle blue bar being unknown, and then below that, um, essentially BIPOC. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I know you took a deep dive into testing last week. I'll ask for the next slide. And this is just to show. Uh, again, race, ethnicity among people tested and just the sheer number of individuals tested um, and just how that has grown over the months. And again, you see uh, the gray bar in the middle is unknown, but above that white, below that BIPOC. I will say the county testing sites are, are really capturing um, the BIPOC community and have, it's been a real resource um, to, to East County and in particular to the, the communities that we really want to be able to reach. Next slide, please. Okay, so the vaccine. So this slide is already out of date. The vaccines are not on the horizon. They're actually, they're here. Um, the first shipment arrived at Legacy yesterday. Um, and uh, this is a fascinating vaccine technology. It's not new technology, but it's being newly used in vaccines. Um, and what it does is it uses mRNA, which is a blueprint for making proteins um, that go into human cells. They tell the human cells to make the protein that looks like the typical one on the surface of the coronavirus. And then the body makes proteins that look like that. And that stimulates all kinds of cells and responses in the body's immune systems to be prepared for when it sees that protein in the real thing, in the real virus. Um, it's, um, Dr. Uh, Vines, yeah. can, you, can you pause for a second? Yeah. Did she cut out for other folks on the call as well or just for me? No. Okay. So but it's just, I just, it just cut out for me. I just want to ensure that people, um, if, if it was everyone else that they, they could hear what you had to say as well. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Thanks. No, and I'll, I'm, I'll take, I'll just, um, sort of finish up here and then I'll open up to questions. So if there's anything you feel like you missed, I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, Oregon is slated to get tens of thousands, really over a hundred thousand vaccines over the next month. Jessica's going to tell you details about that. These are approved under an emergency use authorization, uh, which has been carefully and closely vetted um, by the uh, American um, College for Immunization Practices and the Western States uh, Vaccine Review Committee. And it appears that after two doses, 95% of people are protected from a COVID-19 infection that includes symptoms. Um, common, common reports of things like soreness at the injection site, um, some feeling kind of uh, muscle aches um, and feeling tired in a, the day or two following vaccine. Those were common, um, but we resolved in about a day and there was es essentially no serious uh, adverse effects. So the emergency use authorization looks at the effectiveness, it looks at the safety and it weighs that against the risk of the pandemic itself and the risk of the virus. And so that is what has led to the approval of these first two vaccines with more of course in the pipeline. Um, really briefly, uh, by now you've probably heard the Pfizer vaccine needs ultra cold storage. That's minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which uh, logistically uh, meant a, a lot of problem solving to make sure that the vaccine stayed cold in the distribution and storage. Um, that's going to be followed by a, a Moderna vaccine, which uses the same technology, um, but is more familiar to those of us who work in vaccine and can be stored in a refrigerator. I, I think that's that's it for my part. I thought I would pause. Uh, Jessica is going to share a ton more information with you about vaccine plans, um, but I'm happy to pause here for questions. Sure, we'll uh, take some questions, uh, starting with Commissioner Myron. No questions. So exciting. Thanks. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Um, about testing, Dr. Vines. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of our positivity rate and, and testing numbers, do we know the extent to which they've been influenced by the way, the changes in the way that the state is counting tests? You know, I think we read recently that they're counting sort of duplicate tests. Do we know how that unfolds at the county level? 
Yeah, so the state actually came closer uh, to counting tests and calculating percent positive closer to the way Multnomah County has been calculating it. So they may not they may not match precisely depending on timing and maybe some other artifact of, of the, the exact way they're counted, but the state actually came closer in line to the way we've been thinking about percent positive calculation. Right, so when we look at relative rates, there hasn't been some sort of change because of a difference in counting. Correct. To my knowledge, Multnomah County has consistently ca calculated percent positives, and now the, the state's change brings them more in line with us. Thank you. Commissioner Vega peterson uh, Thank you, Chair. I don't have any questions yet. I probably will have some questions when we talk about the vaccine distribution. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I did have a question. So it looks like uh, we were able probably flattened isn't the right word, but uh, that we were able to prevent a lot of uh, infections. Uh, and so I just kind of wanted to see, I mean, and thank the public, it, it, Dr. Vines, Jessica, if you could talk about it. It seems like um, the communications that were sent out, like they work. I mean, the numbers are still obviously very high, but I mean, can you give me kind of a relativity? Like, how did we do? I mean, and obviously I think it could have been so much worse. I, yeah, thank you, Commissioner Stegman. I'll give you my opinion. I think um, I think it, it could have been much worse. We avoided the exponential increase, which is like compound interest um, on the virus. So we've, while we're at higher case numbers um, and our hospitals are certainly busy, it looks like we've plateaued and that we avoided kind of a Thanksgiving additional climb um, in our numbers. And so that is that is really good news. And we're approximately three weeks out. So I, I think we can start to draw some conclusions, um, but it's almost always, as, as you can see from looking at the at the graphs, it's almost always, you know, the, the, the further out you are, the clearer things are as, as you do your look back. Um, but yeah, certainly our hopes are that people take um, the upcoming holidays as seriously as they did Thanksgiving, because it looked like it worked. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, my hat's off uh, to all of our communications folks at, you know, the state and the county and the local levels, uh, because the word did get out and people did. I mean, uh, I know my family and I know many of your families and all of us uh, revised our Thanksgiving plans. Uh, and uh, but we just have to continue to do that as we approach uh, the next holiday. So just wanted to to see kind of do a, a check and see like we did well. And we still need to continue uh, with those same types of safety planning efforts. Thank you. Absolutely, it does. It does matter. Um, this virus is exquisitely sensitive to human behavior, and so uh, all those changes in Thanksgiving plans added up to fewer people sick, fewer people in our hospitals. So I echo your gratitude. Thank you, Jessica. You're back up. Okay. Next slide. So before I go um, into the um, different pieces around the COVID vaccine, I do just want to reflect back on the comment around what we around what we saw um, and what what appears to have happened over the Thanksgiving, um, mainly in relation to the vaccine. So um, this is a really exciting moment, but it is in no way, shape, or form clearance to kind of go back to normal. We're going to need layered prevention strategies for the months to come. So the efforts that people have engaged in both in the spring and then most recently over the Thanksgiving holiday are incredibly important in the months to come because as we roll this out, it's going to come in fits and starts. Um, this isn't going to be a straight line to um, total community vaccination. Obviously, it's our goal to work as quickly um, as we can to, to make sure people have access to this based on stratified risk. Um, but I just want to emphasize that we're going to need those community mitigation efforts um, for the months to come. And as we learn more about how the vaccine actually works in terms of protecting overall spread in the community. So while it's a moment for celebration, I just want to temper it a little bit with um, we're going to continue to need those um, different protection strategies. So I'm going to talk um, sort of meta level uh, about the vaccine, and then I'm going to go into to some real specifics around what we know is rolling out um, statewide and locally. So this slide represents something that probably many people have heard of or seen. Um, there is a federal advisory committee on immunization practices um, that has endorsed 
um, uh, different levels or phases of um, planned vaccination by, based on what we know right now in terms of risk of exposure, but also morbidity and mortality. And that first um, phase, phase 1A, um, covers broadly um, healthcare providers, um, long-term care facilities, um, and skilled nursing um, facilities. So that's sort of the first chunk of work. And I'm going to talk more in detail about that. I just want to go over this high level. Um, the, the second phase, phase 1B, which is much more complicated and detailed, that's going to require um, local and planning and community input is the whole body of essential workers. Um, so this is the body of work where we really, you know, consider um, what we know now about um, folks that have been working throughout the, the pandemic and their um, potential level of risk and the need to, to keep certain services and work going in the community. So this is a big phase of complicated um, planning. And then phase 1C um, includes adults with high risk medical conditions and adults 65 and older generally. Next slide. So straight out of the OHA playbook. So I'm going to talk generically and then I'm going to go into some specifics. So phase 1A that I just referred to, um, OHA is working to make sure that the following priorities are ensured during vaccine distribution. So these are sort of the um, benchmarks for the entire um, body of work, um, that there's access to vaccine those, for those who want to be vaccinated in phase 1A. Um, obviously, that informed consent takes place and that there is linguistically accessible and culturally responsive information available about the COVID vaccine. Next slide. So what does that include um, in terms of uh, the OHA planning for phase 1A? Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about what's actually happening. So hospitals will be included in phase 1A, and this would include all employees, clinical and non-clinical, contracted individuals, volunteers and students, acute psychiatric hospitals, traditional health workers who provide services in a hospital, um, and healthcare interpreters who provide services in a hospital. So this is a large group of people, and the reason I want to emphasize that is that you'll see comparatively in the numbers, the amount of vaccine that we're getting, it is going to take time um, to get to um, all of the, the people that we're talking about in um, that hospital setting. So just to talk a little bit more specifically about what um, Dr. Vines referred to today, the Pfizer vaccine did start to arrive directly to hospital systems um, this week. Um, the Moderna um, vaccine will, is it, it's expected to arrive soon. I believe they are um, considering emergency authorization this Friday, um, but all of the signals look good for the um, Moderna vaccine, which is the one that is a little bit more, it's more amenable to the um, methods of uh, cold storage that we currently use. So we know how much we'll be getting in December, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about those numbers in, a, in, a, in the next slide. Um, we don't know how much we'll get in January or the exact ratio of each vaccine. Um, so this, these are the kind I just want folks to understand operationally are going to be tricky in the planning. Um, there's a lot of unknowns, so we have multiple plans for these different scenarios. Um, like I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, the top priorities include uh, inpatient hospital employees and their subcontracted staff who also work on site in inpatient settings. Um, so hospitals will receive these vaccines and are responsible for doing that themselves. Um, there is also a priority around pre-hospital um, work, thanking EMS emergency services. Um, this will, um, they will help, uh, hospitals will help EMS get vaccinated um, when we um, receive these initial dose, doses. These, this is being discussed right now. So all of this stuff is in the, the planning phase. And then um, skilled nursing facilities, which I mentioned, and I have another map that I'll show you regarding um, registration for skilled nursing facilities. Um, this is a subset of long-term care facilities. And um, fortunately, and this for me is really exciting to hear, um, especially given where we've had morbidity and mortality, the federal government has contracted with two large retail pharmacies um, to send pharmacies to these facilities to vaccinate residents and employees. And that's part of the first phase of work. So that I just want to take a moment to really appreciate that because that again is where we've seen um, 
really advanced illness and, and death. So that is an amazing piece of work. Um, the next phase of work includes that more that broader category of other healthcare workers and employees and residents of residential and long term care facilities, including adult care homes. So going into those concentric circles out. Um, and we're still identifying which types of healthcare workers will be reached um, first. I know that um, OHA was sending out some additional information, actually may have come out today. I haven't had a chance to look at my emails in the last hour, um, but they are planning on sending additional information out either today or tomorrow um, to get more granularity on that body of healthcare workers. Um, I will say that, that the method that we're going to use um, to, get to other healthcare workers is still uh, being figured out. So this is that um, phase of work, um, the first phase of work that requires really um, detailed planning. There's several ways um, that we're looking at doing this, um, but this is gonna be a um, big lift. And then sort of the third area is um, the, the more um, complicated area that I talked about around essential workers. Um, so OHA has pulled together a um, vaccine community advisory board that they're working with. I believe they closed applications yesterday. I know we sent this out broadly um, to community partners to join that group. Um, local public health will be represented on this group. And this is the group that is going to provide statewide guidance on that large body of um, that large group of people considered essential workers. Um, so, like I said, the, you know, the details and the level of, of discussion there is going to be very complex. Um, so it's very important to have um, transparent uh, conversations about um, how that is being um, discussed and decided on. Um, I will say that we've done a little bit of work already with our fabulous Multnomah County Public Health Advisory Board um, a few months ago, and we plan to revisit some of that work um, as we get more information uh, from the state. So let's do the next slide. So this is just a map that I just referenced. Um, I just wanted to, to share this because again, I feel like this is just a major win on the front end of this vaccine campaign. Um, this shows um, the federal pharmacy partnerships in relation to skilled nursing facilities enrollment. Um, so for our state, um, the state is reporting we have 100% enrolled. So this is a major victory on the front end of this. Um, I know there's a lot of work to do, but I, I just want to take a moment to really acknowledge how important that piece of work is. Next slide. And then this is just a little bit of scaling in terms of the numbers. Um, this is what we um, know preliminarily about how many vaccine doses we're going to be getting um, in December. So the Pfizer vaccine, um, it appears we'll be getting just over 35,000. Um, we, or we did to get 35,000 um, a little bit later next week, we'll get another 40,000 um, with a total of, excuse me, and then December 29th, um, we'll receive uh, close to 50,000. Um, the Moderna vaccine, assuming all things go well with the, um, uh, the considerations this week um, for emergency use, December 22nd, we'll get about seven a little over 70,000 December 22nd, and then um, about 32,000 December 29th. And this includes um, the second dose for patients that receive vaccine from the prior distribution. So as Dr. Vines mentioned, um, it's a two-dose vaccine. Um, so that cuts down on the volume that we're actually getting. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good start, but it is um, going to take a while to, to get to everybody. Next slide. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to talk about um, the decision making frameworks for allocations that the state is using. Um, so in this flow chart, um, in that first box, uh, what's considered is provider specific populations within counties and a percentage is assigned to each county based on the critical populations. Um, from that, there's an allocation that's created that's based on the county proportion of critical population, and we're going to kind of walk through an example next. Um, and then from that, the, the allocations are reviewed based on, you know, operational issues like provider capacity, um, like how people are, are able to um, 
uh, administer vaccines and then storage limitations. Um, as Dr. Vines mentioned, the first uh, vaccine requires um, a different level of cold storage. Um, so that can create some uh, limitations. And then there's additional considerations that are taken in at the county level that allow for flexibility in terms of uh, populations impacted. So SVI is the social vulnerability index, which is a census tract level um, assessment of how counties respond to and recover from emergencies. And then of course, what our COVID-19 impact metrics actually look like county by county. Next slide. So generally what that looks like, this is an example for a county. Um, if we had Oregon statewide allocation of a given vaccine of 10,000 doses, the county that is um, the example on this, on this graph um, will receive 15% of the state allotment, which would be 1,500 doses based on the identified critical population estimate for the county. So then within that, the 1,500 doses need to be divided among the providers. So in this example, we have a hospital, a clinic, and a pharmacy um, that indicates serving that critical population based on a provider enrollment service that the state um, administers. And then there's a final check um, on the distribution numbers um, the state compares the site allotment um, for site throughput or the number of doses per week, um, storage capacities, and rounding up for minimum dose requirements for the given vaccine. Next slide. Actually, I think I'm going to pause there to take questions before I talk about the communications planning. We are gonna start this time with Commissioner Stegman. Questions? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Jessica. So looking at, at that slide, Jessica, so how do they get the under the critical population estimate, the 15,000 number? Um, the state administers several different, if you wanna go, I'm, I don't know if you can go back two slides. 15, yeah. yeah. Sorry, 15, yeah. Um, so if you look, there you go. Um, the state administers several different um, survey tools uh, to, let, to collect information um, regarding the critical population estimate, and I can get the specific uh, survey tools um, after this presentation. Okay, I was just, I, so is that, that's an assigned number by the state? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Okay, yes. gotcha. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Vega peterson Thank you, Tara. Thank you, um, Jessica and Dr. Vines for um, the presentation. So I have a few questions. Um, one of those is, you know, looking back, I think it was um, maybe slide 13, the one that's had the different phases. Um, you know, it seems like um, I, we're not, I mean, it's not like one shipment, right, is gonna cover any one phase. I mean, there's gonna be, especially as we get into like 1B, right, where there's essential workers. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of essential workers just in our state. And um, and so have there been any estimates on terms of like when we think the vaccine will be available through, you know, the first phase of folks um, here um, based on, you know, like manufacturing. I, I know I was talking about this with my husband last night and he was like, well, Dr. Fauci says that we could have, you know, football games and stadiums by fall. I'm like, that's great. This first shipment isn't going to do that. So, you know, so are, have there been estimates of, 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 you know, specifically for Oregon, like what, what it might look like yeah. in terms of meeting our needs? Yeah, right now, based on our um, current allotment that we've received and will receive through December, um, it looks like we'll get through that first phase approximately um, at the end of February. But I just want to temper that with what I said at the beginning in that there's a lot of the, there's a lot of planning and operations involved in um, in uh, implementing this whole process. So I think um, we feel like that's a good estimate and that is our hope that by the end of February, we will achieve coverage of that first phase. But you're absolutely right. Um, when we get into that essential worker category and the planning that's needed to make sure there's a transparent process that includes 
um, a racial equity lens and really looking at, um, you know, who are the essential workers, what are the essential services, um, that that is definitely going to take a longer period of time. I've heard gobs of interviews over the last two days um, on the radio and, um, you know, Certainly, I'm hopeful that, you know, in the summer and fall that we're going to be much closer to reaching those last two phases. Um, but I just want to temper that with all of the reality of pulling off pulling off an operation this large. Yeah, and thank you for that. And I think and so when you went when you were saying first phase by the end of February, that was like the phase one A. Yeah, that's one A. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And I think it just, you know, still reiterates the things we were talking about at the beginning of this presentation that individual, you know, vigilance and how we're um, coming together, wearing masks, you know, um, distancing, all of those things are just going to be critically important as we move into 2021. Um, and as we are ramping up, you know, all of the the vaccines. Um, and, and thank you, Jessica, for talking about the, you know, that we are going to be um, using an equity lens and really looking at um, populations that are being most impacted. You know, again, like week after week, we've seen um, the populations here at Multnomah County that are experiencing this mo the most are our BIPOC community or Latinx community. And, and, um, and so, and I haven't heard on the state conversations really that, um, that, that fact or, or how we're looking at equity, you know, in terms of distribution, but it definitely is going to be a, an important component within each of these different phases that we're looking at. So thank you. Mr. Jeff. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jessica. Um, yeah, just a couple of follow up questions actually to, to Commissioner Vega Peterson's question. Um, and I think I'm just phrasing it a different way. So when we get to that, that big myth of 1B, the big category of essential workers, I'm assuming there's going to be some sort of prioritization process even within that. Is that what you're what you're anticipating? Yes, that's probably the biggest body of work ahead of us is um, revisiting. Um, you know, some of this planning has been done. There's historical planning that has been done around essential workers, but I think it needs to be refreshed with a different lens of this particular pandemic. So that is probably the biggest body of work other than the actual operationalizing of this whole venture is digging into um, you know, a community understanding of essential workers and having to make um, very difficult decisions um, over the next several months. But that is really where um, local public health is actually gonna have um, quite a bit of activity. Um, we've already started some of that, but with, there's much more to be done. But yes, you're absolutely right. Great, and, and, and really good to know that local public health is gonna have significant involvement in that. Um, and then the other question goes to the point uh, somebody was, was making about even once we have that vaccine, the need for masks continues. And um, I just want to be clear that I understand the vaccine, these vaccines protect the people who receive the vaccines from exacerbated symptoms and, and you know, uh, perhaps from getting the disease. I'm not entirely sure. But we don't know yet that they prevent transmission. Is that right? Yeah, Jen, do you want to speak a little bit to that? Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. Um, it's it's a it's a fine point and a good pickup. Um, the vaccine, the vaccine was tested against endpoints of COVID nineteen infection that came with symptoms. So we know it protects the user very well from that. You're correct that we can't say whether it prevents transmission. We can't say if it prevents uh, an asymptomatic infection. Um, so there is, there is some nuance, and you're right that masks and social distancing are going to be with us for a long time. I'll also just point out that both of, both of these vaccines that we're talking about today are two doses. They have to be three or four weeks apart, and your immunity is, is really not revved up fully until two weeks after the second dose. So even if at the individual level, it's, it's about a six-week start-to-finish uh, process to have that individual protection. Yeah, I really appreciate that. It's so hard to both be excited about this, and we should be because it's really good news, and then say, and but, we're, you know, and but, we still have to do these things. So that's just an important message to get out there. Thank you. Commissioner Myron. Oops. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you, Dr. Vines and Jessica. Um, I want to echo this is a sort of almost, uh, you know, just again saying a little bit differently, but um, echoing what my fellow commissioners have said, uh, this is such 
an exciting and uplifting briefing compared to our usual COVID fair. Uh, you know, um, I feel 2021 in the air. It's about, you know, it's almost upon us. But the and but, um, as Commissioner Jayapal described uh, so well, you know, that being said, um, you know, it's not going, none of this with regard to the vaccine is going to happen overnight. And so um, there's a lot to be worked out. I'm excited about our, um, you know, about local public health involvement in the conversations and stra uh, strategy at the state level. Um, and I'm glad that we can influence, hopefully, uh, as we have in the past, some of these broader state approaches. Um, and we need to continue all those strategies that we know work with the masks and hand washing, et cetera. Um, and also, as we're doing all of that, um, as you described so well, Jessica, we really need a layered um, and I hope tailored prevention strategy moving forward because it will be months before we're sort of in a place where we can think about those football games or you know, getting back to normal. And, um, and so uh, the real world, our COVID world continues. Um, what I hope at the state level is really taken into account that will affect us in the county is um, developing approaches that are really tailored um, at this point. We have enough information about virus transmission and a lot of that um, background so that we can tailor our approaches so that we can allow schools to reopen in an effective way. Um, you know, have approaches where our restaurants and bars can open in a way that will uh, protect the business and uh, people going to that business um, and just, you know, help, help our, our local businesses that we hear from all the time and get our economy going. That can happen at this point with the knowledge that we have and planning moving forward. So. Um, I am excited about that and hope to see that coming from the state amidst all the excitement about the vaccine. So um, I just want to say uh, thank you and um, and just say a particular thank you to Jessica uh, because I'm looking at you. As I say this, I'm looking at you in my screen. I don't know how it appears on anyone else's screen, but um, you, uh, you know, I'd asked a number of questions about testing last time, and I really appreciate your um, connecting with me and talking me through that. It was so helpful, and um, and just your approach here. I just you you jumped right in, and um, I, I deeply appreciate your work and and all that you're doing for the county. Um, so thank you. Well, we're not done yet. All right, Jessica, <laughs> take it away. Yeah, thank you for that. Honestly, Commissioner Myron, I, I really, I feel like I'm up here representing um, a, a, just a ton of work um, that that not everybody gets to come in front of the board. So I, you know, if, if folks are listening, I cannot thank people enough who are on our team. We work with the best public health team on the planet as far as I'm concerned. I know I'm biased, but um, yes, people are just working so hard in service to the community on every aspect. And um, on that note, um, you know, somebody mentioned before, um, I think it was Commissioner Stegman about thanks to the communications teams that have, have really just um, worked furiously uh, for the last almost a year now. Um, and I think it really is, um, uh, as my mother would say, the proof is in the pudding. You know, when we look at uh, the numbers for December and late November, um, I definitely think that the communication the strategies, culturally specific liaisons, volunteers in the community, people who are out there every day working on a communication strategy, as you understanding what the values are, what, what glue that keeps the community innovating on that um, to make it while, be, um, while, be, while being physically apart. 
So one piece that I just wanted to mention, it goes without saying, but I do want to just spend just to chat about it for a second because this is probably that we've undertaken and um, we have a fabulous county communications team and a public information group and health communications and like I said, um, community liaisons that really carry this work. So what is in front of us is a very complex communication task. I mean, you can just see from the slides we just shared. These are not easy messages to package and deliver and work on with uh, multiple different communities. So the state and the federal government are obviously planning large scale communication campaign campaigns. I've actually seen some of the work that's been coming out um, that that we'll see a lot more of. Um, but what we're doing here is we are working with a regional communications group, which we've done all along. But we're very conscious of how important that is um, in terms of the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, I know the group, I think they initiated their first planning, real planning meeting two weeks ago um, and really are ensuring that the planning is community informed um, from A to Z. Um, so this is where our liaisons are so important um, to uh, give feedback into the strategy and the messaging because there are different strategies that need to be developed across different groups. Um, I know we've talked about this before, but in public health in particular, there's been um, egregious historical um, atrocities that have, have happened from public health. So that includes examples like Tuskegee. Um, you know, these are all um, factors that we have to consider in the strategies um, for both vaccination, but also communication. So this group has really dug in to develop these different communication pathways and I can't thank them enough. Next slide. <clears throat> so this is just a high level um, look at the communications planning. Um, the goal is to maximize the number of people choosing to receive um, COVID-19 vaccine in order to eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in infection, hospitalization and deaths and curb overall community spread. So then underneath that, these are just our general objectives that we're working on as a region, obviously um, building confidence and really responding to community questions and concerns regarding the safety and efficacy of the vaccine, which we know existed before COVID-19. So that's not like a new body of work, but for this in particular, given the speed of um, getting it uh, to market, if you will, is important. Um, acknowledging and addressing concerns specifically from our BIPOC communities and immigrant communities, as I said, with, with established experiences around um, distrust of healthcare and government that has to be factored in. Um, tailoring uh, strategies and messages to respond to unique cultural considerations of different communities in the region. Um, fostering realistic expectations, and as you can probably already tell, I tend to be the person who um, embodies a lot of trying to foster those realistic expectations, having been through this um, at least one time before, um, you know, knowing that there's going to be hiccups, um, the availability of the vaccine, um, getting uh, operations established, um, and the ongoing need for continued prevention measures, as we've, as we've discussed a few times here today. And just the basics. Um, when or how and by whom, um, making sure people know where to go, much like we've um, undertaken with our testing strategies, making sure people have accurate um, and timely information to make decisions um, for themselves and their families. I think that might be it. All right, that was a lot of information. Um, I really appreciate the presentation this morning. Um, we will start, we'll have our last round of questions and comments. Uh, we'll start this time with Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Um, uh, I had one uh, quick question I think you answered and I, I'd forgotten it, um, but back with, with regard to the vaccines, I heard from a couple of constituents about this. It was on that slide 15 as well and it, um, it spoke to that distribution and um, one of the, the groups being distributed to um, with the critical, you know, the critical workers is um, clinics and recognizing that um, there are a lot of clinics out there, including our own um, community health clinics that do not fall within 
uh, one of the traditional, you know, the big healthcare provider systems and concern that, hey, these are frontline healthcare workers as well. Where do they fit into that um, hierarchy? And so it it looks like for those clinics that it's just, you know, a percentage taken off the top and then that's distributed in a certain way. So there is some getting to those smaller clinics um, in addition to the larger amount that is going to the hospital systems and no one is going to have enough, but, but that that is the, the approach. Yeah. One of the first things that we're doing um, is looking at um, exactly what you're talking about. So smaller non-hospital affiliated um, primary care to see where the gaps are, because that's one of the operational details that we need to work with hospital and healthcare systems with is because um, there isn't going to be a firm mechanism to establish that. So that's one of the first things that we're doing as part of that 1A category. So that's definitely on our current planning. Great. Thank you. Um, and otherwise, uh, just thank you again to you and your team and love what you said about uh, communication. Commissioner Jeb. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, no additional questions. This just thank you, Jessica, Dr. Vines, and the team. And really do also want to appreciate your calling out communication as its own body of work. It's not something ancillary, but critical to, to this work. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Commissioner Becky Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, yep. Thank you, um, Jessica, for this. And you know, I don't think it's biased to say we have the best public health team. Uh, you know, I think it's just accurate. So there's, there you go. If it's biased and accurate, that's still OK. So um, I just appreciate all the work of everybody who isn't on the call today and who doesn't have to come present to the board. Um, but just um, it's been amazing what's happened over the year. And as we look forward to like some good things about 2021, just want to want to just um, add my voice to that appreciation. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I echo uh, my fellow commissioners' gratitude that uh, we all have had our staff and you know lots of people come and present before the board, and we know that there are there's a whole team of people behind the presenters. So I think it is really important that we acknowledge uh, all the people that are serving on our public health team and all of the the folks in our communications office. Uh, but I did have a couple of questions. Do we have any idea of how long the vaccine will last? So we get this first round, and I think Dr. Vines, you said that it takes about six weeks before you uh, become immune potentially, but so do we know like, okay, but then do we have to get revaccinated in a year or what does that look like? Yeah, so thanks Commissioner Stegman. That's a great question to point out that this, the studies and our understanding of the vaccine and the virus are ongoing. So all of these questions about does it, you know, will it prevent transmission? Will it prevent, um, uh, you know, long, you know, long, so-called long COVID, for example, that's all going to emerge as more people get vaccinated and as the original uh, trials continue and follow follow people for longer. Um, so this uh, approval, this emergency use authorization is based on about two months worth of data starting from the, the, the time of the second dose and including all of the dosing and safety components that, that come before that. Um, but like with anything, there, there will be lessons along the way. And again, if there's a, a one in five million uh, adverse effect with this vaccine, we're not we, we're not going to find that in a trial of 40,000 people, even though 40,000 people is pretty reassuring. But um, another thing to be prepared for is that there may be uh, more learnings about the vaccine, uh, either good or bad, as time goes on. Okay, thank you. Um, and the other question I had about is um, in the phases in the 1B phase, like it showed the education sector, but it didn't really say, like I'm envisioning teachers and kids going back to school. Like are students factored into being in one of those phases, especially when you look at the educational sector? Um, so I can go ahead. Well, I was just gonna jump in and say, um, there, there may be trials of vaccine among children just now starting. The vaccines that we talked about today are approved for ages 16 and over. So it's gonna be a separate question around vaccinating children. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. Uh, and then uh, what about like 
people that are contemplating like elective surgeries, what is your advice around that? And and not, you know, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, people need, you know, maybe annual or, uh, you know, things that they don't have to do immediately, but they do need to do. What What is your advice around those types of things? That's a great question. I know right now, um, most, if not all the health systems have cut back pretty dramatically on so-called elective procedures. And these are Elective is kind of a misnomer, right? These are these are procedures that can wait a few weeks as opposed to procedures that can't. Um, so right now, just for capacity reasons, a lot of health systems have cut back. I think if you're getting at the uh, healthcare safety component, um, I think healthcare is, is pretty safe. Uh, we have really robust infection controls within our health systems that we public health work with closely. So I would say, uh, you know, for someone who needs care, There were a lot of anecdotes from last spring about people really having worse health outcomes for having put off uh, medical appointments um, because of fear of COVID. I think in general, medical care is uh, is safe here in our region from a COVID standpoint. Nothing is 100 percent, but I think each individual needs to weigh uh, with their health care provider. What what is the urgency of this appointment or this this thing? versus what's what's the risk that I'm going to pick up COVID at a health care appointment, which I would say overall is, is fairly low. Yeah, and I appreciate that perspective. Uh, and I'm thinking also just from the standpoint of, uh, you know, keeping capacity at our our hospitals and clinics. Uh, what what are your thoughts about that? Well, health systems, um, they they have their own scheme for figuring out um, what they can accommodate and, and what they cannot. And that's probably going to evolve as, as we move through winter and as we adapt to uh, a higher caseload of COVID uh, in, in hospitals. I can't speak as much to clinics, but I know that um, one of the benefits of this year has been uh, tele, telehealth, essentially, uh, essentially being fast-tracked. Um, And so there are more creative ways for people to get care um, that they need. And I think there are still in-person ways for people to get care. So again, I would say depends on the specific clinic and the the individual, but I would, I would encourage people not to just wholesale put off whatever it is they may need to do for their health, but to, to, to really consider the the whole picture and what their personal health care provider can accommodate. Thank you. Um, And then uh, one other question I had was around herd immunity. Uh, I was in an association of counties meeting uh, yesterday, and one of the commissioners had mentioned uh, we were debating whether or not uh, around a certain bill around vaccination. And uh, one of the county commissioners mentioned that their children was, you know, their immune system was compromised and the importance that, that their child could not get a vaccination and how important it was. And, and I just didn't know, like, what, like, where do we have to be? What's the number? Uh, if you could speak to that. Yeah, so herd immunity um, gets at this idea that when it, when enough people in a population are immune, either because they've had the disease or they, or ideally because they've been vaccinated, um, that it that it, it protects the whole group, even those who can't get vaccinated for medical reasons, like your example, Commissioner. Um, I think I've, um, estimates for this particular vaccine are somewhere around 70% of the population. Um, I'd have to double check that if you want an exact answer, um, but it's it's a combination of how effective the vaccine is, how many people get it, um, and in what time period that's really going to limit transmission of the virus and, and, and get us to hopefully a level where COVID-19 kind of recedes into, in, into the background of our lives as opposed to being front and center. Great, thank you. Uh, and the last thing I would offer is that uh, that last slide that you all shared with us about the outreach, it actually reminded me of a lot of the outreach that we did uh, during uh, the census outreach because we had to shift during the pandemic and we really were addressing things like food insecurity and building uh, relationships uh, with marginalized community members. So I would just offer, as I'm sure that our entire board uh, would, whatever communication we can help provide to our individual districts. Uh, I know in my district, uh, we've really built some important uh, relationships with folks. So just would offer that uh, as we c- continue to communicate with folks. So thank you. Thank you, Jennifer and Jessica and your teams for this briefing this morning. It was really helpful and informational. And as it was the first time we've talked about vaccines, 
Um, I'm sure there will be a lot more <clears throat> questions as we move forward, um, but I think that the overall message of good news and yet nothing's changed right now for us. So we have to keep doing what we're doing and um, doing a good job of that from the graphs that we saw, no um, big spikes over the holiday um, or from the, because of the holiday. So thank you again. Thank you all commissioners. And we have no for further board briefings this morning. We will be back here Thursday, 930 for our regularly scheduled board meeting.